All right, so we're, I'm going to introduce our next uh, heart failure faculty member, uh, Dr. Ju Kim, who's going to be talking about chronic systolic heart failure in 13 minutes and 30 seconds. Well, I think I, I'm down to eight minutes, and I think I have to start with ECMO. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, this hopefully will be a quick overview. I'm going to try to do it in seven minutes, because I heard there's going to be lunch after maybe one more talk, one more talk. Um, okay, so let's, let's get going. Hopefully this is a, a review for most of you. I still think this is probably the most important talk for most of us in this room. I heard that there's a lot of you guys going to interventional cardiology, but all of us will be cardiologists taking care of heart failure patients. And uh, you heard about how bad it is for people to come to the hospital with acute, acute decompensation. So hopefully with this, we can keep folks out of the hospital. Everything I'm going to tell you in the next seven minutes is going to be coming straight from the guidelines. Okay, This is from the 2013 guidelines, uh, as well as the uh, focus update that was uh, published just recently. And just to quickly define, you know, I think I don't know if we've defined heart failure, but it's a clinical syndrome, right, uh, that results from any kind of structural <clears throat> or functional impairment of the ventricular filling or rejection, right? So any kind of myocardial injury that decreases LV uh, performance and uh, decreased cardiac output uh, ultimately activates this neurohormonal responses with the sympathetic nervous system and the RAS system. And, and at the end of the day, all the therapies that are guideline directed are trying to, uh, to target the neurohormonal responses. Let me go through this. So there's many different ways of classifying heart failure. You guys have heard already. One of them is based on the ejection fraction, which probably you guys are most um, uh, comfortable with. Uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is defined as an EF less than 40%, uh, with, whereas preserved ejection fraction is defined as EF greater than 50%. There's also this borderline area of 40 to 49 um, that uh, is being uh, 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 grouped in with the HEF-PEF pathology, and I think uh, Dr. Hussein's going to talk to you a little bit more about HEF-PEF after this. So a lot of the guidelines that I'm going to go over with you are uh, predominantly addressing the, the HEF-REF population. You guys have seen this already. The ACC uh, classifications are stages of heart failure from A through D. This is <clears throat> what ultimately drives the, the medicines that we, we use for our chronic management of heart failure. Uh, those of you with a uh, those of us with hypertension or diabetes or some risk factor for heart failure are stage A. And stage D are obviously all the folks that you guys have heard about that need things like mechanical circulatory support or LVAD or transplants. Uh, okay. and, and this matters because with uh, each progression of, of stages, uh, their one-year mortality goes up. And uh, now this is the fifth talk that has uh, brought up the functional classifications. And uh, you guys know why that's important. Keep in mind that uh, in terms of ACCHA stages, it progresses really one way. So once you have risk factors, uh, but no structural disease in your stage A, and you have structural disease in your stage B, you can only get worse. Uh, whereas in terms of the uh, NYHA classifications, we can actually modulate their functional capacity uh, based on medical treatments. Okay, so let's go through all the stages. If you have stage A, that means you have some risk factor, but no structural heart disease whatsoever and no symptoms. And in that case, it ultimately comes down to controlling risk factors. Um, hypertension, this, I think this is one of the, the general cardiology board questions. Hypertension is, one of, is the biggest uh, modifier risk factor for heart failure. With well-controlled hypertension, it's, I, you can reduce the uh, potential risk of uh, developing heart failure by as much as 50%. Other conditions like diabetes, smoking, uh, uh, and, and weight loss uh, can also reduce your risk. So at the end of the day, class A, control your risk factors, or stage A. Stage B, um, in, in folks with reduced ejection fraction, okay, ACE inhibitors or ARBs should be used, um, as well as beta blockers. This is, should be no, no um, surprise to you. I, I want to just point out for you guys down at the bottom in terms of what, what not to do. So the, you will see folks in the hospital where, where people with a reduced ejection fraction will come in with rapid atrial fibrillation, and an emergency room or somebody else will give them a, a big bolus of diltiazem and put them on a drip. So try to avoid that, okay? Because non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers in those folks with low ejection fraction uh, may cause harm. Okay, so we're going to spend the bulk of our time in stage C, right? Though these are the folks with structural heart disease, whether it's uh, prior MI or LVH or some structural disease, as well as current or prior symptoms of heart failure. So ACE inhibitors are, are probably the, the first line, along with beta blockers, which we'll get to next. ACE inhibitors are recommended in folks with, with heart, uh, HEFREF. Uh, ARBs are also indicated with uh, class one evidence, uh, but right now the way the guidelines are, are written, ACE inhibitors are first, and if they're not tolerant, then you can go to ARBs. 
At the end of the day, I think it's reasonable, as you can see by the third one, that to use either ACE or ARB. But um, uh, keep in mind that, again, the last thing is what not to do, right? So we know not to combine ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So choose one or the other ACE inhibitors first. Beta blockers, right? We all know that there's three uh, uh, beta blockers that have been proven to reduce mortality and heart failure. Uh, those are bisoprolol, carvedilol, and sustained release, or succinate, the form of entoprolol. Um, <clears throat> in terms of dosing, uh, this is not meant to be a big data uh, uh, talk, but at the same time, a little bit's better than none, right? So at least a little bit of beta blocker is uh, give you a, um, a, a potential benefit uh, versus none whatsoever. So again, three, three beta blockers, topolol succinate, carvedilol, and bisoprolol. By the way, these guidelines, one of the tables uh, uh, really goes into depth in terms of what the starting dose should be and when the target dose should be as well. So uh, it's something to, to look into. Next is the uh, mineralocoid uh, receptor antagonist. So things like spironolactone and plerinone. These are indicated in folks with any symptoms, so class two to four uh, a heart failure within the F35% or less. Just keep in mind the, the GFR and, and the potassium. So those folks with a GFR less than less than 30 or a potassium that's greater than five, um, you should be wary of starting. But uh, anybody with an EF less than 35% with symptoms, with class two, or class, two to, class two to class four symptoms, should be on a myralocoid uh, receptor antagonist. Hydralazine and isordil, this combination, not one or the other, but uh, the way the studies were done based on the AHEF trial was a combination of hydralazine and isordil. Right? This is uh, predominantly uh, proven in folks who self-identify as African-Americans who are already tolerating the other medications. So this is uh, not meant to be written as instead of an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, it should be on top of, but it is, as you see by the second point, it's, it's, it's reasonable to use this uh, instead of an ACE or an ARB in case uh, they do not tolerate it because of blood pressure or due to renal insufficiency. The joxin also is, a, a, as you see, a level two evidence, uh, a class, uh, sorry, level two evidence of um, uh, in patients who uh, with uh, have ref to decrease the uh, hospitalization. So this is straight out of the guidelines again. So anybody with stage D HEF ref, whether they have symptoms or not, should be on an ACE or ARB with a beta blocker. Right? That's that's everybody. And if they're congested, this is my pointer right here. So if they're congested, then you add a diuretic, which is straightforward. If they have class two to four symptoms, but their uh, GFR is okay and they're not hyperkalemic, add a mineralocoid uh, receptor antagonist. Um, and if they symptom, uh, class self-identify themselves as African American, um, and they're already tolerating an ACE or an ARB, it's reasonable. To, it's a level uh, class one evidence to add ice or dough nitrate. And as you can see by this table here, it doesn't take much. The number needed to treat is not much to actually reduce mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. A uh, quick word about anticoagulation. Really is only indicated in folks with HEF ref and atrial fibrillation. There's very little data to, uh, to really no data to anticoagulate someone with just chronic um, systolic heart failure in sinus rhythm. There's multiple studies that have been done. Um, but anticoagulation, those with heart failure is only really indicated in folks with AFib. And anticoagulation can be with any agent based on the chas scoring system. So again, I think it's important to know, you guys have heard about beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and all this stuff. This should not be a surprise to you. But things not to do are to combine an ACE or an ARB with uh, uh, MRAs and um, <clears throat> the non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Not recommended. Okay, so that's the 2013 guidelines. The most recent would be in the focused update that was released recently. And that's uh, two drugs that you guys have heard of by now, the Sacubitrol Valsartan and the Vibridine. Sacubitrol Valsartan and ARNI really was uh, based on the Paradigm uh, HF trial, really that showed a significant decrease in uh, the primary endpoint, which is cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. So <clears throat> based on this, it is now a level one uh, uh, level of uh, recommendation that in those with symptomatic HEFREF, with class three, two or three symptoms. So anybody with symptomatic heart failure who have previously tolerated an ACE inhibitor, and that's like predominantly because the study was done on those folks who tolerated an allopril, um, that re replacing that ACE or an ARB with an RNE, such as Sacubitrol Valsartan, uh, is recommended. Remember, it should not be added on top of an ACE inhibitor. In fact, if they're on an ACE inhibitor, you need to wash that out. So you have to stop the ACE inhibitor for at least 36 hours before you can start an RNE. And if, they've, uh, if the patients have had a history of angioedema with an ACE inhibitor, RNA should not be prescribed. 
Ivabradin is uh, based on the shift trial, right? Ivabradin is the, the funny channel inhibitor that slows the heart rate, independent of the mechanisms that the beta blockers use. It's, uh, it's attacking the sinus, sinoatrial node. And again, the shift trial, the primary endpoint was uh, shown that Ivabradin use in the appropriate population, which we'll define in the next slide, uh, decreased cardiovascular death and hospitalization. Now, this, this outcome was predominantly driven by uh, decrease in heart failure hospitalization more than cardiovascular death, but it also made it into the guidelines recently as a uh, uh, class two, <coughs> level evidence two, to reduce heart failure hospitalizations in those patients with symptomatic heart failure, again, with an EF less than or greater than 35%, who are already on guideline-directed therapy, including tolerating a beta blocker at the maximal, maximal tolerated doses and in those with sinus rhythm. So you can see there's a lot of, uh, with a heart rate greater than 70. So these folks have to have a low EF, have tolerated uh, maximal tolerated doses of beta blockers, be in sinus rhythm, and still be tachycardic with a heart rate greater than 70. And those folks, Ibravidin can be used to reduce heart failure hospitalizations. Okay. Last slide on ICDs. This <clears throat> somehow finds its way into the, the boards all the time. Um, at the end of the day, primary prevention ICDs, anybody with an EF less than 35% with class two or three symptoms already on guideline directed therapy, anyone less than, uh, with an EF less than 30% with class one. Um, the other main point with this that's made in the guidelines is that the, these folks have to have an expected mortality greater than one year. So if there's some other condition that is restricting their, uh, uh, limiting their mortality uh, to less than 12 months, then ICD is, uh, should not be uh, is not indicated. Um, and then in terms of CRT, uh, it's indicated in those folks with an EF less than 35% with a left bundle and, and a wide QRS, which you guys have seen before, that should be in sinus rhythm. It is, uh, can be considered in those patients with a left bundle with a QRS less than 150 or in a non-left bundle uh, with a QR, like a right bundle pattern with a QRS greater than 150. If you have any questions, just read the guidelines. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or otherwise, we'll be available at lunch too. All right, I think I did it. All right.